registrar, the university librarian, provost of the College of Medicine, the dean of arts, deans of other faculties, the postgraduate school and of students, directors of institutes and centers, heads of departments, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen. The 442nd in the University of Ibadan inaugural lecture series will be delivered this evening by Professor Christopher Van Kole Ondubisi Ogogo, the head department of history on behalf of the Faculty of Arts. Born on 10th October 1963 in Lagos to Chief Andrew Tukudebe Ogogo and Mrs. Alice Cecilia Ogogo of Umuok Puni Village, Oguashuku in Delta State, Professor Ogogo attended St. Thomas Aquinas Primary School, Suruleri, and Township School, Lagos, and Port Harcourt from 1979 to 1975 for his primary education. And he was at Stella Marit College, Port Harcourt, and County Grammar School, Ikoreche, both in Rivers State, from 1975 to 1980 for his secondary school education. He proceeded to the then River State School of Basic Studies, Rumo Ola Port Harcourt, in 1980 for his advanced level certificate, which he obtained in 1982. He subsequently gained admission to the University of Ibadan later that year for his BA degree in history and graduated as the best student in his class with a second class honors, upper division, in 1985. He participated in the National Youth Service Course Team at the then College of Education, Oka in Anambra State in 1986, and immediately returned to the University of Ibadan for his MA and PhD degrees in history, which he obtained in 1987 and 2004, respectively. Between 1991 and 1997, he obtained an LLB degree from the Upper Femme University in Leife, as well as a Bachelor of Laws from the Law School and LLM too. He joined the services of the history of this as an assistant lecturer. In 1988, he was promoted lecturer grade two with the fell from 1st October 1991, lecturer grade one with the fell from 1st October 1995, senior lecturer 1st October 2004, reader 1st October 2007, and professor of history with the fell from 1st October 2012. Till date, Professor published over 70 articles in academic journals and books. He has successfully supervised 11 PhD theses and over 56 master degree dissertations in African history, as well as in peace and conflict studies. Within this university, Professor Gugu has served in several capacities, including acting head, Department of History from 2008 to 2010, and substantive head of department since 2014. Is editor about the School of History monograph series. Outside our university, Professor Gugu has served as advisor for over four years to the American Humanities Program of the American Council for Learned Societies. Is national president, Historical Society of Nigeria, public relations officer and treasurer of the Nigerian Bar Association, Ibadan branch, between 2002 and 2005. He has been external examiner to many departments of history as well as assessor for promotion into the professorial cadre for many universities. He has served as consultant to the Federal Ministry of Research and Development Council, United Nations Development Program, UNDP, the Waste Election Reform Panel, Guaranteed Trust Bank, University Press Limited, among God. He was a visiting scholar at Northwestern University, Everston, in 2006. He has also been visiting in 2007 and a two time a two time visiting professor of African history at Kennesaw State University in Atlanta, Georgia, USA, 2010 and 2014. He had a stint at St. Augustine University of Tanzania, Mwanza, in 2010. He is current editor in chief, journal of the Historical Society of Nigeria. Professor Google has won many academic grants, such as the Institute, of, Institute for Research in Africa, IFRA Grant 2005, Makato Foundation Grant 2006, the University of Ibadan Senate Research Grant 2007, and the Humanities Staff Development Grant 2015. Professor Gugo is a member of several academic and professional bodies, 
prominent among these are the Ethnic Studies Network, Ireland, American Studies Association, the African Studies Association, USA, the Nigerian Bar Association, Society for Peace Studies and Practice, the Institute of Chartered Mediators and Conciliators, and the Historical Society of Nigeria. He is a fellow, Society for Peace Studies and Practice, as well as fellow Historical Society of Nigeria. He is married to Mrs. Peace Kisara Ogogo, and the marriage is blessed with successful children. I now call on Professor CBN Ogogo, Head Department of History, to deliver his inaugural lecture titled In Defense of Tradition. Deputy Vice Chancellor Academic, Deputy Vice Chancellor Research, Innovation and Strategic Partnerships, Registrar, Liberian, Provost of the College of Medicine, Dean of the Faculty of Arts, Dean of the Postgraduate School, Deans of other faculties and of students, Directors of Institutes, Members of Council of the Historical Society of Nigeria, Distinguished Ladies and Gentlemen. I mount the podium the Badon inaugural lecture podium, conscious of its hallowed tradition as an emporium of sound academic research to reflect over issues that shape the times we live in, and as a historian, to see how pale reflections of our past have shaped the present and their likely impact on the future. My understanding of the task before me in being asked to give an inaugural lecture is simply to give a report of my intellectual engagement and activities as they contribute to illuminating truth, which as achievement and accomplishments, and believed that Ibadan was a preeminent university in Nigeria. I was therefore encouraged to make the University of Ibadan my first choice in the quest to study law in 1982. My elder brother, ABC Obubu, was already at the then University of Ife studying law. Having topped my advanced level class in the then River State School of Basic Studies, Port Harcourt, I confidently applied to Ibadan. My admission letter was delivered to my father's chambers, but with a dramatic twist. Rather than the law I applied for, I was offered the BA honors course in history. Since I never applied to study history, I was convinced that there must have been a mix-up, which will be cleared when I get to Ibadan. Law in Ibadan was then a department under the Faculty of the Social Sciences and was superintended by Professor Dutton Phillips as the dean. I promptly sought audience with him on arrival in the university for my proper placement. In the course of our interaction, I was informed that only those with a first degree were admitted to study law in the Baden. The law program in the Baden was then a postgraduate degree. Therefore, the decision of the admission panel, given my very good performance in A-level history, was to offer me admission into the Department of History. After a year of study in the department, at the feet of great and world-renowned masters, I was beaten by the Baden School of History bug. My lecturers had succeeded in firing my imagination and aspirations. The department was at the commanding heights of African historical scholarship. I was so enamored with the quality of scholarship in the department that I jettisoned the offer to study law at the University of Lagos, where I was offered admission a year after I arrived at Baden. About a decade later, I took two law degrees from Obafemi Awolo University after the demise of my learned brother. It was a deliberate decision to uphold my family traditions. My grandfather, John Okulie Ububu, was a powerful court clerk in the early decades of the 20th century. My father, after retiring as, the direct, as a director at the Central Bank, continued in the tradition of being in the Temple of Justice, when he practiced as a legal practitioner and served in the Delta State Judiciary. He passed the baton to his son, ABC Ubogo, whose untimely demise imposed on me the duty to carry the mantle in defense of what had become a family tradition. I have happily discharged my duties in getting the fourth generation of Ubogos, Olise Mekelim and Chukwebuka, to uphold this cherished tradition. While the family tradition that I was called upon to defend is pretty clear from the above story, let me now proceed to the academic tradition 
which has defined my historical scholarship for three decades. It is this engagement with historical scholarship that I regard as my first love and wife, while law, apologies to Lisa Nebuka, has remained my paramount conceptualizing tradition. The ideological brain for this lecture in defense of tradition derives from Edmund Burke, the 18th century political thinker and activist. In his call for caution during the rampaging years following the French Revolution of 1789, Burke advocated for a gradual change that should be anchored on tradition. As noted in Jeff Winthrop's discourse on Burke, and I quote him, Traditions are not simply blind habits or inexplicable superstitions. They present the crystallization of the historical experience of a society, the ways that it has gradually built up to organize its characteristic activities and deal with its characteristic problems. Therefore, tradition provides a corpus of collective human experience from which as individuals and as a society, our decisions and actions should be informed. Tradition as a concept in history encapsulates change and continuity. It accommodates change, but not drastic change. It is the product of a thorough sifting of values and ways of life over time by a society, community, or group who accepts these values into its corpora. Indeed, tradition does not about change, for in reality, it is a product of change, except that such change is not only gradual, but also a product of the status quo. It therefore defines a people's culture, values, and the basis of their contemporary existence. Simply put, it encapsulates their history. To ignore tradition is to ignore history, and this will be at the peril of the society, community, group, or individual. Tradition need not be an impediment to development and progress. Indeed, it should make change comprehensive and meaningful. Viewed from this perspective, Tradition becomes a facilitator of change. Put differently, for change to be meaningful, it must be anchored on tradition. That is, change based on the people's historical experience. Properly understood, development, which we all seek, has to be anchored on tradition in order to be impactful and meaningful. Else it becomes disruptive, ephemeral, and baseless. To understand and appreciate tradition, therefore, we must have an enduring sense of history, since it is encapsulated in history. While for the professional historian, tradition is part of the collage of what makes up history. For the African, tradition represents the totality of history. Mr. Vice Chancellor, sir, my first proposition on which this lecture is anchored is that it is from tradition that we largely derive our history, our essence as a people or community, it follows that what I will partly be dealing with is how my academic sojourn has been in defense of tradition, put differently, in defense of history. Such a defense is only symptomatic of the hallowed tradition of historical scholarship established by the builders of the Baden School of History, my teachers and mentors, who represented the finest traditions of historical scholarship of their time. As Benson Mojo et al. opines, it is to their eternal credit that they created so far Nigeria's only globally recognized academic brand. I'm a proud product of this school, which has produced outstanding academics. These were the leading scholars in African history, giants on whose shoulders I have stood and upon whose tradition I anchor today's inaugural lecture. As I have argued elsewhere, by the closing years of the colonial era, the Department of History at the University of Ibadan had generated sufficient interest in the study of African history. Omo Kadike succeeded in recruiting a number of his colleagues and former students who turned the department into a bastion for the propagation of African history. Apart from the extensive curriculum review to give history at Ibadan an African focus is widely credited with introducing an African perspective into the study of African history. With Abdullahi Smith, and others, they founded the Historical Society of Nigeria, published the Badon History Series, Journal of the Historical Society of Nigeria, and the Tariq Series for the promotion of historical scholarship in the country. Africa was the central focus of their study. Within the first 25 years of the existence of the Department of History at Ibadan, 
it succeeded in implanting its imprimatur on the global academic scene. The 1960s and 70s were golden years of this famous school and for Nigerian historians. Its scholars and products were sought after all over the world. Historical studies boomed. It was in recognition of the outstanding output of the Badon scholars and the relevance of their works that informed the avalanche of appointments that members of the history department experienced. The department has the record of having produced the highest number of vice chancellors for the University of Ibadan and for other Nigerian universities. <clears throat> the Historical Society of Nigeria was not just an Ibadan creation, but has been led by distinguished Ibadan academics. After Kenneth Dickey, Ade Ajayi, and Obaru Ikimi, I am the fourth Ibadan scholar to assume the position of national president. Becoming the president of this numero uno, becoming the president of this numero uno academic association and promoting historical scholarship could be likened to mounting the throne of my academic forebears, another instance of upholding tradition. What I have tried to do in my scholarship and advocacy in the defense of the Princeton traditions of the Badon School of History, among these are the promotion of historical scholarship, especially African history, the deployment of the historian's craft in understanding and preferring panacea to societal change, and the utilization of historical scholarship as the basis of and the stimulus for change and continuity. The University of Ibadan provided the platform from which I sought to accomplish the above task. I was lucky. I had, arguably, the best training that was available anywhere in the world. Ibadan therefore remains a great influence in shaping my intellectual engagement. I have an insurable interest in the maintenance and recalibration of its finest traditions. Towards the late 1970s, the discipline of history in Nigeria had begun to show signs of stresses and strains. This was due to a concatenation of factors, which time and space will not permit us to explore. It suffices to state that a deliberate government policy which, induced, which introduced social studies and civics to the school's curriculum resulted in the expunging of history from the curriculum of the first nine years of the school system. This action has resulted in disastrous consequences for the historical knowledge of ourselves as a people, indeed a development which with grievous implications for our nation building efforts. I'd like to submit that most of our contemporary challenges as a nation are traceable to the crass deficiency in historical knowledge by first our leaders and policy makers and then by the followers. The choices we have made over the years have, been, have not been informed by our historical experience. It is important to remind the critics of the Badon School of History that our dwindling fortune is not peculiar to high alone. It is merely symptomatic of the crisis that besieged Nigeria's educational system since the 1960s, when the military intervened in the governance of the country. What is the scorecard of other departments that flourished at Ibadan and produced world beaters at the same time with the history department? What is the situation in Ibadan's medical sciences, chemistry, economics, classics, English and religious studies departments in the global arena? Their dwindled fortunes are a reflection of problems that are largely systemic and external, related to the general tendency to destroy all things bright and beautiful in the country. The obvious focus on the, on the Department of History's misfortunes is understandable. This is because her light shone the brightest, a demon of which is bound to generate considerable attention and protest. Let me add this. Let me end this bit by reminding us that the essence of giving this audience the trajectory of my background and exposure and panoramic view of the Department of History at Ibadan is to be able to demonstrate the complexity and multifarious influences that characterize the traditions that have forged me. In spite of all the complexities, that which remained most impactful on my scholarship has been the training I received from the Ibadan School of History, a school whose traditions of academic excellence I have defended for about three decades. Although the fortunes of this school have dwindled appreciably, it still remains the most formidable center of historical scholarship 
in the country. Its foundations have remained rock solid in spite of the stresses and strains of the times. When I chose to focus my doctoral thesis on the Niger Delta, some crucial developments informed my choice. First was the fact that, the growing, that growing up in Port Harcourt, I had experienced the lush green vegetation of the area. And years later, the level of devastation caused by oil pollution to what was an aquatic splendor. This later experience left a lasting impression that required interrogation. The impression partly accounted for my motivation to focus my intellectual attention on the Niger Delta. Second, the agitations for resource control were becoming central to the growing disquiet in the region, and some of the major participants were known to me. Furthermore, a preliminary study of literature on the fledging imbroglio in the Niger Delta was such that none had serious historical tap roots. I pondered on why the pioneering works of DK's trade and politics in the Niger Delta and Ikime's Niger Delta rivalry were not part of the discourse. Social scientists like Chris Uporupu, Ehusa Osagi, and Nigi Badigeshi were some of the dominant voices on the developments in the Niger Delta. The perspective of historians in the attempt to explain the then unfolding violent eruptions in the region was missing. Convinced by the Badon tradition that a historian must ply his craft to address societal problems, I decided through a historical study to interrogate the changing nature, demands, dimensions, and parties to the Niger Delta conflict in the belief that it would enable us to understand the evolving resource control crisis in the region. This, I argued, was only going to be possible if the challenges were historicized. I proceeded to posit that contrary to the focus on the contemporary challenges posed by the oil and gas industry in the region since the discovery of oil at Uloibri, the reasons for the restiveness of the region lie in a much deeper past and preceded the beginnings of the oil exploration in the 1950s. In my study of the Niger Delta, I called attention to the fact that what, was, what has become the struggle for resource control has a deeper and broader meaning beyond the mere control of the oil and gas resources. The point was further made that there, has, there have always been complaints of lack of infrastructural facilities in the Niger Delta, even during the colonial period, and this was a persistent problem. Drawing from my legal background, I have contended that the question of ownership of resources that was in contest fell within the purview of fundamental rights of the autochthonous peoples. Relying on the African Charter and several pronouncements of the Supreme Court, I have argued that what is indeed, what is needed is the recourse to these provisions of the African Charter in enforcing the rights of the Niger Delta peoples. In explaining the federal government's persistent neglect of the Niger Delta people's agitation, for improved infrastructural facilities, I sought explanation in their lack of effective representation at the center from where the resources are disbursed. This absence at the critical decision-making level before the era of good luck Jonathan was largely a product of the minority status foisted on the peoples of the region. As I have demonstrated elsewhere, the Niger Delta peoples became minorities only when Nigeria was put together in 1914. Apart from seeking to understand the various trajectories of the Niger Delta conflict, some efforts have been focused on charting a path for sustainable development of the region. I have posited that the Niger Delta states should necessarily structure their economies beyond the oil economy. I have also, in my study of the Niger Delta, called for the establishment of an environmental core by the federal and state governments. A United Nations Environment Re Program report has shown that the task of cleaning up the Niger Delta's degraded environment is one that will take decades and billions of dollars. It therefore follows that setting up a core dedicated to restoring the environment will be a worthwhile venture. This can be used to retweak the current amnesty program, which will empower the youths with appropriate skills for already existing employment opportunities that will sustain a lifetime career. In all these intellectual forays, the driving force has been to use historical discipline 
to address societal problems. More importantly, the number of historians undertaking research into the colonial and post-colonial era of Niger Delta's history has increased significantly. Prominent in the roll call and Kemo Nyekwe from the University of Lagos, Ben Nani, J.H. Emenugwim, and Ukorobia in Port Harcourt, who hold aloft the torch lit by E.J. Alagwa. While Samuela Galino joined the intellectual contestations from Milone to be counted for a badon, Atari Dadi Uwe, Usel Lucas Sonya, and Fidelis Egbe, whose PhDs I supervised. Of great importance is that the voices of historians now resonate in an area of specialization in which their forebears were the cutting reasons. To consolidate the study of the Niger Delta in Ibadan, I introduced the course Niger Delta Agitation and the Nigerian State. And I have, I have been teaching the course at the master's degree level since 2005. I have also supervised more than 23 master's degree students on various aspects of Niger Delta studies. As part of sustaining the tradition of the study of legal history, I have demonstrated the primacy of Ibadan City with regards to the origin of the Nigerian Bar Association. Legal practice may have started in Lagos, but the origin of the Nigerian Bar Association is traceable to Ibadan. Apart from my other writings in this area of specialization, I have produced two PhDs in legal history, Drs. David Ajayi and Enibuku Uzebu. My report will also extend to other areas, aspects of Nigerian history in which I have endeavored to make my contributions. I have taught for two, over two decades the course on Nigeria, the problems of nation building. Having realized that too many of our younger citizens know little about the Nigerian Civil War, I have facilitated the floating of a course on the Nigerian Civil War. I have also produced three PhDs that are focused on different aspects of the Civil War. Dr. Chiama Kanwaka, a worthy product of the Badon School of History, who currently plies her craft in the University of Benin, is my first fruit. And we are very proud of her intellectual accomplishments. She interrogated the Catholic Church and conflict management during the Nigerian Civil War, 1967 to 1970. The second scholar whom I produce in this area of specialization is Dr. Diwe Mokucha. The latest of them all is Dr. Pascal Onumonu, who has added the internally displaced person's perspective to the study of the war. Let me add that a good number of the doctoral theses I supervised have won major grants from international organizations. I have supervised the unique study of Dr. Bashir Anima Shawns, the Dedo Chiefs and Land Politics in Lagos, 1500 to 2000. Bashir, who is with the Lagos State University, is holding high the banner of historical scholarship. It suffices to state that in my scholarship, I have tried to instill in others the unique Ibadan School of History's tradition as bequeathed to me by the masters. It is pertinent to mention that I have not rigidly stuck to tradition. We have sought to accommodate change within the context of tradition. For instance, I have supervised the doctoral thesis of Albert Onowa Edu on development of vaccination policies on smallpox and yellow fever in Western Nigeria, 1900 to 1945. The work represents the dynamism that has attended the study of medical history in Ibadan. Moreover, only recently, a 69-year-old record was broken under my headship of the department. Ibadan produced her first first-class honors degree in history. This is change within the context of the hallowed Ibadan tradition. To be sure that it was duly end and be able to defend this before the court of her forerunners, I chose to supervise the student's long essay in his final year. This, I believe, will enable me to have a closer interaction with the student. Let me assure everyone that Mr. Ozibo Ozibo, the jinx breaker, is a worthy Ibadan first class and will, without any ruffles, credibly defend his degree in any climb. Another student, this time a female, has finished as our second first class graduate. The glass ceiling has been shattered. Indeed, our traditions have been reconfigured, but not recklessly disrupted 
or abandoned. They bring back history projects. By virtue of my office as president of the Historical Society of Nigeria and as head of the Department of History at Ibadan, it is imperative at this juncture that I shift focus to specific contributions in the defense of the tradition of historical scholarship as bequeathed to us by the aforementioned four years. It is necessary at this point to pause and ponder over why tradition requires a defense. I have argued that for most non-professional historians, tradition is synonymous with history. Consequently, the same question can be posed as to why history requires a defense. In Nigeria, the answer is obvious. As a matter of government policy, the study of history as a subject was removed from the primary and junior secondary school curriculum in 1982. The cumulative effect is that for about 36 years, Nigerian school children have been deprived of their study of history as a result of a deliberate government policy. The Vice Chancellor, sir, I contend that various aspects of our national life are in disarray because we, are we have recklessly abandoned our traditions, our lives in all ramifications, education, economy, politics, and values have been terribly infected by the virus of disorder. Our glorious past has been jettisoned and recklessly abandoned. The country and her citizens are hurting because we have neglected a most critical tool for nation building. I have argued elsewhere that most of the conflicts across the country are products of the paucity of historical knowledge. Nigerians have continued to repeat the mistakes of the past. We are perpetually trying out new experiments without any recourse to our experiences. For instance, we have tackled the current headsman crisis as if it was a new, as if it was a new, as if it was new to our climb. How did our forebears solve these problems when they arose in the past? As we cry and condemn the so-called headsmen, how many of us have taken time to do a detailed study of them? If Nigerians want to live in peace and with adequate security, they must engage their history. A nation that neglects our history does that at our own peril. As J.F. Adiyajai, the doyen of the Badon School of History, aptly warns, the nation suffers, which has no sense of history. If today Nigerians are suffering, you know why. The realization of the enormity of the damage that the lack of a sense of history has done to our national lives, propelled the Historical Society of Nigeria to embark on a protracted struggle to bring back history to Nigerian schools. This struggle started in the 1980s during the presidency of Professors J.F. Adeajai, Obaro Ikimi, Ibiegbere Alagwa, and Godfrey Uzoigwe. The struggle was given a new impetus from 2005 when Yakubu Ochefu assumed the leadership of the society. In my inauguration speech as president of the Historical Society of Nigeria, I decried the appalling state of historical scholarship in the country and rededicated the new council of the society to the completion of the struggles began by the earlier generation of scholars. Bring back history to the classroom became our mantra. One of the strategies I embarked upon to recalibrate the study of history in Nigeria was to alter the configuration of the parties. Of course, part of what I learned from the astral struggles of the early 90s was that before we embark on a struggle, we go ahead to sensitize the community, the traditional rulers, and so on. And so to bring back history, we decided to adopt the same strategy. Having effectively enlisted the support of Obi of Onicha and Oni of Ife, we succeeded in generating discussions around the subject matter while at the same time engaging the media. Some journalists like Edmond Obilu, then of Splash FM, and Suleiman Alede, of, then of Channels TV, collaborated with us in the struggle to bring back history. I like to recall that it took the intervention of Professor Bawuru Bakindu to have easy access to the Honorable Minister of Education and other top government officials. By the time we met with Malam Adamu Adamu, the Honorable Minister of Education, the public space was agog with the request to bring back history. Our strategy had worked. The encounter, <laughs> the encounter with him changed the narrative positively. 
He simply asked us not to bother to take coal to Newcastle. I am happy to report that by 2017, the new history curriculum was given official approval by the National Council on Education. History as a subject is to return to the classroom from September 2018. When this new school session starts, in the defense of history, we felt that to concretize our gains, there was the need to have legislation on entrenching the study of history as a subject. So we sought and got the cooperation of the National Assembly. Our most willing partner was Senator Ali Wakili, representing Bauchi South constituency of Bauchi State. The support of the Senate President, Senator Bukola Saraki, also needs to be acknowledged. He it was who suggested that as in other climes, the teaching of history in our school system be made compulsory. Senator Wakili subsequently moved a motion that was well received in the Senate, unfortunately and painfully. Our most formidable ally in the legislature, Senator Wakili, died in March 2018. This unfortunate incident, coupled with the turbulence that has characterized the political space, has slowed down efforts at getting legislation for making history a compulsory subject in the entire Nigerian school system. But we are not relenting. We are still plodding on with getting it done. I am happy to report that I, am, that I led the team of experts to produce the manuscript of the textbooks from primary one to junior secondary school three that will be rolling out of the press before the end of September 2018. It need be added that in keeping with tradition, we have also resuscitated the production of the famous Tariq series to complement the materials for teaching history. Thus far, I have demonstrated how in several ways I have striven to defend the tradition of historical scholarship, both as an Ibadan scholar and as an administrator of a professional academic society. In all these efforts, in all these efforts approximate to the defense of a sound historical tradition, which seeks to inculcate in the citizen a sense of history. Concluding remarks. The Vice Chancellor, sir, as the University of Ibadan celebrates 70 years of its existence, as a citadel of learning, how much of our history is known? At various public gatherings within and outside this university, the students and graduates of this university often exchange greetings by bellowing, greatest UIs. See? While the greatness of Ibadan is incontestable, I often wonder how many UIs can give an evidence-based justification of, his greatness, of, of this greatness. This was what informed the department's research proposal on the 100 icons of the University of Ibadan. Unfortunately, lack of funds has led to the scaling down of the proposal to a personal project on the icons of the Ibadan School of History. After all, it is said that charity begins at home. One of our icons is here present in this hall, Professor Moni Adewoye. <laughs> the point being made is that as Nigeria's foremost citadel of learning, we must continue to uphold the torch for others to see the light, to do an informed and impactful history of this institution, the university archives, will need to be revived, digitalized, and well-funded researches can be carried out. We have a good documentation of the university at 25 and 50 years. Let us have a proper documentation of our grades. Also, it is time to plan and set the building blocks of Ibadan at 100. Lastly, our history as an institution tells us that the history department is one of our very strong selling points. Let us take advantage of this realization to nurture that which has made us proud and relevant in the global space. Just like the University of Ibadan often justifiably requests for a special treatment from the federal government of Nigeria, history department requests same from the managers in the Tekena Terminal building. Why we thank the federal government for restoring history to the classrooms? It is enjoined to give 
the funding of historical research, a special attention given especially the starvation that the discipline has suffered in the past. I have argued in my address to the Senate of this university on the passing of Emeritus Professor Tekena Tamuno that the tribute their passing generation requires is the adequate funding of historical research. Part of what a bad on historical scholarship bequeathed to African studies is the extensive use of archival materials in historical research. The quality of a historical piece is largely determined by the quality of sources used. Let it not be forgotten that the National Archives was set up by Professor D.K. as the historian's laboratory. The National Archives across the country urgently required rejuvenation and massive investment of funds. The, regu the regulation consigning its serving as a repository should be adhered to by all. For my fellow historians, let me repeat a note of caution that I have expressed elsewhere in writing. It is true that some of us, in the bid to save our jobs, in the face of the dwindling students' enrollment for our program, changed the nomenclature Department of History to Department of History and International Relations. For others, it is History and Diplomatic Studies, or History and International Diplomacy. These changes have come in different colorations and complexions to reflect current hustles. I recognize that this has been done with good intentions. However, it may result in an unpleasant consequences, in very unpleasant consequences in the future. In other climes where university education is of greater antiquity and from where we borrowed the modern idea of a university, the name history has been retained for the department. In fact, at Oxford, history department has been upgraded to a faculty of history, which has several areas of specialization. At Harvard, a university established in 1636, they have retained the name history department. Even our mother university in London retained the name history department, happily in Ibadan, conscious of our history and traditions. And after a thorough debate, we have stuck simply to the old cherished name Department of History. We stood by tradition. I have submitted that the current change in nomenclature sweeping through the departments of history in Nigerian universities is not only superficial and a manifestation of exhaustion, but it is indicative of a loss of confidence in history as a discipline. The discipline of history is too solid to require an appellative qualifier and or modifier. It has stood on its own and midwived several other departments. It has a great past and a very promising future. What is required is a recalibration of what we do and how we do it, and not a leaning on others. If, as some have argued, it is a response to societal demand, then we are in a situation where the tail now wags the dog. Only recently, our earlier warnings and fears have begun to materialize. I was approached in my capacity as president by a second generation university to intervene in her matter, the point of contention between them and the almighty National Universities Commission was that they were due for accreditation, but the NUC officials were insisting that given the double barrel name, they had to reflect in their curriculum equal number of courses for their history as well as their international studies program. Since they did not have enough international relations courses, their head of department, a non-historian, simply yanked off some of the courses in history to bring it at par with those in international relations. The casualties included the historiographic courses. I was called to prevail on him to restore them. Simply put, the NUC now insists that where a department has a double barrel name, her course content must reflect the duality of their nomenclature in equal measure. Now we have heads of departments of history who are not historians. Where historians are supposedly trained, our methodologies are strange to them, and they are not members of the professional association of historians. Our history as a discipline indicates that it was this shoddiness in attitude and lack of clear thinking that led to the initial acceptance of social studies and civics as substitutes for history at the primary and junior secondary school levels. 
and unthinking recourse to parochial expediency, which landed the discipline in trouble. Again, the double barrel departments are faced with serious methodological issues. With what methodology will a political scientist teaching international studies to history students supervise their final year long essays? Furthermore, at the peak of their career as academics, to what chair will they be promoted? Professor of History or Professor of International Studies? Thus far, they have all opted to be promoted to a chair in history. These days, as editor-in-chief of a leading journal of African history, I'm amazed when colleagues send articles for publication, and such articles do not have a single primary source. Can such colleagues who interrogate subject matters on Afghanistan, relying on only secondary sources, expect to be published? This can be likened to a lawyer who anchors his case on hearsay evidence and expects to have a good day in court. In virtually all such cases, these colleagues are often from departments with double-barreled names, where there is apparent confusion in the methodologies to which they have been exposed. Recently, I was asked to assess a candidate for promotion to Professor Keda. The candidate, in his entire publication, never used or displayed knowledge of primary sources. Yet, his intention is to become a professor of history, not of international studies. Of course, in the case in question, I defended the tradition. <laughs> let us as historians, thank you, let us as historians learn from the mistakes of the past and give a deeper thought to the changes that we seek to effect. We can have a department of history with several areas of specialization which can crystallize into programs or subunits of the department. This is our direction in Ibadan. And as we turn 70 years of age, we will maintain that tradition. <laughs> Furthermore, I like to plead with our colleagues in the profession to engage in the writing of history textbooks for our children. Although these texts will be of no value for promotion purposes, at least if you are in Ibadan, they will be contributing to shaping the future of our children and society. There is a serious death of good history textbooks in the country now for, re for obvious reasons. Only recently, a publisher brought a new history textbook to me to review. In the section dealing with the Yoruba, the author stated that Ududua, the eponymous progenitor of the Yoruba, was born in Ileife. Sadly, the book will be sold. Happily, the author is not a historian. If we do not seize the opportunities created by the success of Bring Back History Project, Charlatans masquerading as historians, we seize them. We need to write proper history textbooks in order to defend the tradition. The Vice Chancellor said, as a country, a community, and a citadel of learning, we must strive to uphold tradition in every facet of our lives. This will require our having an enduring sense of history. <laughs> Acknowledgements. I have found this section most difficult aspect of this lecture. I have been in the University of Ibadan, where my academic career has been forged for 36 impactful years. I have therefore benefited from many persons who have contributed immensely to my academic personnel. I will play safe by adopting the law of categories. I recognize the hands of the Almighty in my academic search on thus far. It is by his grace that I have come this far. My all is accorded to him for he rules in the affairs of men. Next to God are my parents, my father, Chuku Debe, Andrew Ogbobo, Okilulo Ogwa Shuku, and Erun Sukwa, remain the pillar of support throughout my academic enterprise. It is to his loving memory that I dedicate this lecture for his men's love for quality education. I thank my mom, Alice Cecilia Ogbobo, for her sacrifices and continuous elation at every academic feather added on my red cap. My siblings have also been supportive, and I thank them. I thank my uncle, Anwole Kaububu, for his sagacious counsel on several occasions and his presence to represent the Ububu family at this lecture. I'd like to particularly single out my late elder brother, ABC Ububu Esquire, who was always there for me. He offered his shoulders for me to stand on. 
I thank the boys in my dormitory. Ulise Mikelim, the peace setting leader of the park, in whom I am well pleased. Chukwe Buka, Ekenemo Ulise, and Udoka, all of whom have proved themselves great tributaries of the Okilulu. I must especially appreciate my sister, a former Evelyn Uluwatokwe, her husband, Reverend Kanon Uluwatokwe, and my beautiful nieces. I thank Tuchuku for joining us and for being part of my story. My Namorata, Tatus, deserves a special mention. I thank you for your love and opening a new visa. For my academic mentors, I have acknowledged them much earlier. Again, I thank them. I also thank my friend and supervisor, Professor Albert Isaac Olawale, who has emerged as Nigeria's foremost peace and conflict studies scholar. Very close to my heart are those I have produced in my academic image and likeness, my doctoral degrees products. Only recently, they have pulled together to endow a prize in the University of Ibadan in my honor. I also specially thank my professional colleague, Dr. Philip Afaha, for initiating and producing a 453-page book in my honor to celebrate the advocacy for history. I am most grateful for both gestures, which give me the impression that I have done well in defending the tradition. I thank all my colleagues in the department who, in spite of distresses and strains, challenges and cooperation, have contributed in upholding the tradition. I must also thank the other academic staff of my department for their support in administering the department. Also deserving of my appreciation are my colleagues in the Faculty of Arts, the premier faculty. I thank them all. I have benefited from my intellectual interactions with colleagues from outside the University of Ibadan. I would like to thank members of the Council of Historical Society of Nigeria, they are here present, who have helped to uphold the tradition bequeathed to us by the DK generation. So far, I believe we have fought a good fight. I would also thank, like to appreciate especially, Professor Yakubu Uchifu, Olayemi Akiwumi, Okwe Okwe, Siri Lemondi, Sam Agaliuno, John Pongri, Mohamed Kiari, Philip Afaha, Bauru Bakindu, Sati Fashwak, Musa Maman, Ihime Kai Fidon, Abdullahi Ashafa, Eddie Eragbe, J.H. Emenugwem, and Dr. Yopele Banigu, who have been very supportive in taking history to fellow Nigerians. I thank Professor Aki Alawu, who flies the flag of Ibadan at Obafemi Awolo University, Leife. Professor Luko Yaoge for being very supportive of the society. Outside our clients, deserving of my appreciation are those who have helped to further my intellectual pursuits. Professor Richard Joseph of Northwestern University, Dr. Judith Byfield of Cornell University, Professor Caroline Bryan of Rutgers, Professor Tony Falola of the University of Texas at Austin, Professor Akamu Adebayo of Kennesaw State University, and Professor Nico Demos Awasom of the University of Switzerland. I have earlier in this lecture indicated that I have made several trips to different parts of the country in pursuit of the Bring Back History project. For all the time I have granted, I was granted permission for these trips by the Vice Chancellor, Professor Iduwo Lainka. I thank you, sir. I thank him and his management team. I also thank my dean, Professor Ademola da Silva, a comrade in the struggle to maintain the tradition of excellence. My friend and colleague, Professor Adere Miraji Oyelade, deserves a thank you for his friendship and being one of the best deans the Faculty of Arts has had in recent times. I thank Reverend Gumba Oyo, Nnam Dionye Kachuku, Blessed Ijebo, and all members of the God We Do It Ministries family. The very Reverend Dr. Oki Oyelade and members of the Chapel of Resurrection for providing me with spiritual succor. I thank my social groups in the senior staff club, where I believe the best brains converge and get preserved. <laughs> for, my particular for particular attention are the members of table one of the club, who have crystallized into a family and also the palace for the times we have shared. My secondary school classmates, co Gramsci, County 80, the awards of encouragement and humongous achievements have been a source of inspiration. They are represented here by Dr. Ehain Kwakman, who came all the way from Port Harcourt. I thank you. I thank particular families and friends who have sufficiently imparted on my intellectual pursuit 
I'd like to begin with the Akanita Koko One of Ubunkan, a profound and prodigious intellectual, Professor Promise Okpala, whose academic output has been a source of inspiration. Also deserving of my acknowledgement is the late Olushe Ladipo, a quintessential philosopher whose cerebral engagements account for my several publications in the field of philosophy of history. I thank Oladuni Odebowale, my learned brother, most engaging intellectual, whose courage and fight for all that is pure remains unrivaled. I enjoyed the conviviality from his family and I thank them. I express gratitude to late Michael Usiwe and the entire Anya Usiwe family, the Ogbenegis, the Osangwis, the Kimes, the Upokulus, the Obogus, the Okuneyes, the Elueses, the Uporupus, and the Anya Chupus, all of whom have impacted positively on my academic career. I thank my students from my students over the years in the universities of Ibadan, Benin, Northwestern University, Evanston, Kennesaw State University, Atlanta, and St. Augustine University, Tanzania. Finally, I thank you all for honoring my invitation to be here for this lecture. Your presence has helped to maintain the Badong tradition of inaugural lectures. Thank you.